Yep. Yep. If they Testing. if they crack. <laughs> You might need to turn your mic on. Yes, we are going to get started. This panel is the personal, personal and, and the political. Is activism an inherent part of writing about this place and its people? I am setting in for George Ella Lyon, who sadly her, her back went out yesterday. Uh, and she wanted so badly to be here, and, um, and so send her good, good thoughts right now. She, even, she went to the doctor and tried to talk him into letting her come, and he wouldn't let her. So I'm going to sit in for her. Um, we have Frank Walker here, Richard Haig, Denise Jardina. Um, I'm Silas House. I realized earlier I forgot to introduce myself, so uh, nice to see you all. Um, <clears throat> We are all writers who have delved into the political in one way or another. Um, in the description for this panel, it says, do those writing about Appalachia have an extra responsibility as writers because they're from a place that is so often a hotbed of the major issues facing our nation? Do we writers have a responsibility to give voice to the voiceless? So that's sort of what we'll be talking about today. Um, that's something that I think a, a whole lot about, and it's, it's something that is often a real balancing act um, to make sure that your writing doesn't become a polemic, you know, to always make it first and foremost about the story, about the characters, but also to tackle some of those issues. And I've done that a lot in my creative writing, but I also find myself being put in that position as a writer in general from the region being called on to talk about those things. And I know you all have as well. Denise even ran for governor. I don't know if you want to talk about that. <laughs> but um, I, I just recently, uh, last week, I had a call, um, an NPR called me and asked me if I would be willing to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to talk about the Kim Davis the county court clerk, Kim Davis, situation. And um, they told me that they specifically wanted me to talk about, they wanted me to put the culture in context. So I felt like I needed to try to do that, you know, because a lot of the media already wasn't doing that. They were presenting Moorhead as this little podunk town, you know, that had nothing going on. and. Everybody thought just like Kim Davis. Some of the media was already doing that, and certainly the Twitter spear was, was doing that, or whatever you call it. And um, so I had seen some of that, and uh, so I wanted to try to give better context for that. Um, and so there again, I was sort of in the position of feeling like I needed to do that, even though you know I, I hadn't asked to do it. Um, and I you know, did it the best that I could, and I got lots of letters, emails, calls from people thanking me, and lots of letters, emails, calls from people telling me how awful it was, what I had done. <laughs> so as an Appalachian writer, often, you, you can never please everybody, of course, so you might as well not try. You know, all you can do is represent your little, I don't know, postage stamp perspective on that world and I think that's something that people often forget is there are many different Appalachias. People don't want to think about that. They want to <laughs> clump us all into one kind of Appalachia or we're all just alike, we all think just alike, we believe just alike, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's the reason that so often we have to speak up in a way that I, I think, I'll just put out there, I think that Appalachian writers have to do that more than most other people from other regions do. So if, if you all, um, if anybody wants to jump in there, I have a couple stories to share, but I would love to hear your alls first. Anybody? When, when you first sent me an email and proposed that question, uh, if you could read it again, uh, something about is there an inherent responsibility or need for Appalachian writers to deal with political issues? 
I sent you back an email and said the short answer is no. <laughs> and, uh, and I still feel that way, actually, because I, I feel that um, the first responsibility that the writer has is to the work and nothing else. And uh, uh, that's what comes first. And um, not everybody is called to, to write about the political. Not everybody's called to be an activist. I think that's part of the question was, do you need to be an activist? Uh, and sometimes you don't have time to be an activist. Um, but the writing itself can be a, a, a point of activism. I mean, that could, that could be what galvanizes people. That could be what illuminates this, the problem for people. Um, but, you know, I started out as, I mean, I'm very interested in politics. I've been interested in politics since I was a, a young kid. Uh, and uh, so that's an inherent part of who I am. And so that's going to be an inherent part of my writing. Um, but I, I don't think that's, that's going to be the case for everybody. Um, and I also think that the writer is not, uh, I think when I look at my history, the, the, the writing that I have done has mostly been when I've not been an activist. Uh, the, the exceptions were the early 80s when I was involved with uh, the uh, Massey coal strike in West Virginia, uh, and then I was involved with, uh, I moved to Kentucky and I was uh, the secretary treasurer of KFTC during the broad form deed fight, those of you who are old enough to remember that. Um, and I was writing Storming Heaven at the same time, and the two things seemed to feed off each other. And also I was young <laughs> and, and kind of crazy, and I had an NEA grant also that allowed me to do that. But, but when you're trying to make a living and you're trying to write a book, you don't always have time to be an activist. And the other times I have been pretty active, like when I ran for governor, is when I didn't have a book on, the, I had no idea what I was going to write about. So I thought, oh, I've got nothing else to do. I'll just run for governor, you know. I, I mean, you know, some people go off into the mountains or go to the beach or something, and I just run a third-party political campaign just for the fun of it. But... Um, uh, but they don't often go together. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that you write about what you're called to write about. And in my case, that was a lot of political subject matter. Uh, but not everybody is. You can be a Flannery O'Connor growing up in the Deep South and, and not particularly engage in, what, in the civil rights movement of that time because you're writing your, you, this is not what you're called to write about. Um, but yet, wouldn't you say that everything you have written has a political angle? I, I mean, I would think that about your writing. Everything has like a social consciousness. Yeah, I would agree. So yeah. it's like, it gets all tangled up, I think. Mm -hmm. It is. Where you mm -hmm. can't really escape it, and it's often because of the region you're writing about. Even in Emily's Ghost, you know, there's that social consciousness that is somewhat informed by Appalachia. But you say Wuthering Heights is the first Appalachian novel, right? So, of course, a novel about Emily Brown. Yeah, I'm, that, I'll, I'll proclaim that, by the way. But Wuthering Heights is the first Appalachian <laughs> novel. And I will go to my grave believing that. <laughs> so, wouldn't you say that, Dick, that it just sort of gets tangled up? And uh, very much so. It, uh, when Wendell Berry says, eating is a political act, well, so is writing for me. And I don't think it was at first. I think, I think the turning point in my writing life was when I joined Southern Appalachian Writers Cooperative. And uh, there were people, you know, Gurney was there and uh, Bob Henry Baber, another person who ran for governor of West Virginia a couple of times. Um, and it was, it was very exciting times. It was late 70s, all broad form deed stuff was going on. And for the first time, I think I saw uh, actual writers being political rather than being mo mostly literary. And when I was in college, you know, it was pretty much the, the, uh, the standard way of thinking that poems were not political, even though in 1968 or 69, a huge anthology of poetry was published called A Controversy of Poets. It was all political stuff against the war and everything else. So um, I, I think I was awakened as a writer because of political activity and, and political uh, thinking and talking uh, among the members of Southern Appalachian Writers Co-op. And then, I, then you know, the, the horizon kind of got larger as I, s I became more aware of what was happening politically and writing around. Right. Yeah, I, I think there, there are two things at work. I think on one hand, what we do is very layered. I mean, we just wrote about one thing which I think is impossible. I mean, we, family, place, 
social justice, you know, uh, identity, all that gets spurled into one thing, uh, in, even in one poem. But I also think that, I mean, it's hard to love something uh, and not want it to be its best thing or to, to not be defensive about it. So if you, if you love your community and you see bad things happening to your community, then it's, I think it's a natural thing to resist that, to, to find yourself trying to defend it and without even calling yourself an activist, you know, you're doing this reflexive thing that came out of a place of love, you know. Uh, so I, I think a lot of us, I think about the work that Crystal does, uh, I think having a bookstore is, is revolutionary. It's an it's a act of defiance uh, in, the, in the space where they say that well, everything is digital and nobody reads books anymore. To open a bookstore, uh, some people say that's crazy. Uh, but I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's, it's brave. I think it's, it's a way to, to say that I believe in something different in a different speed. Uh, I believe, and I think being a parent also changes you. And for me, uh, I became a different person when I realized that, you know, sitting next to my daughter, that I wanted certain things for her. Uh, and they may be more interested in what was happening in the environment and the land and the water and the food. Before that, when I was young and, and reckless, I didn't care. I didn't think about that. So I think growing up, aging gracefully or ungracefully, um, you know, trying to stay uh, awake, you know, kind of forces you as a writer to, to look at things differently. Uh, or you're writing science fiction. Yeah, I love that. Staying awake, being awake, moving through the world with a conscious heart. You, you're talking about being a parent. Well, it reminds me of uh, when uh, the, there was a, a writer's group that was very involved in mountaintop removal for, for a long period um, that sort of banded together and decided to try to bring as much attention to it as possible. All we had to fight back with were words and music, you know, was our idea. But at one point I, I received a real threatening email from a coal mine executive who who, who basically told me I should uh, not let my children be playing out in the yard so much. You know, I mean, it was a real thinly veiled, but also very blatant threat. Mm -hmm. And my first response was never to speak out against mountain tar removal again, to just, to just, you know, not ever be political, not to say anything, because my children's lives were being threatened. But then, I don't know, Five minutes later, I thought I have to, this means I have to fight even harder because it really shows me what they're up against. It became more about fighting for them as part of that environment, for sure. So that's something that has been a huge part of, of that effort for me. I also love what you said about love, and sometimes it's love-hate too, isn't it? I mean. I often find myself getting political when I'm really, really mad about something that's going on here, that I want us to act differently. I want us to react differently. And so I, I have to write about it. It's the only way I know how to push through it. It's the only way that I've ever known how to survive anything is by writing about it, you know? Um, but I first got involved with the environmental movement in 2005 Wendell Berry called me and several other writers and said, I want you to go to Eastern Kentucky with me and I want us to go on a tour of mountaintop removal sites and we're just gonna, we're gonna do flyovers, see it, you know, at its massive scale. We're going to um, go up on a healthy mountain, have somebody show us all the medicinal stuff that we're, you know, losing. Then we'll go up on a mountaintop removal site. But the main part, the part that became huge for me was that we went to a community meeting and there was just a notice put out that anybody who wanted to talk about their experience with mountaintop removal could come and talk. And this was at the Hyman Settlement School. We got there and people were just lined up. You know, they were just, we were there. There were some of you here who were there that night. Um, I don't know, three or four hours just listening to people testify and tell their stories. And every single one of them, when they finished talking, they said, you all have to tell our story. Nobody will listen to us. And somebody, I can't remember who, said that throughout history, when, when the people's legislat 
mentors failed them, the people always turned to their artist, always, you know, to tell their stories. And so that for me was the huge moment of feeling like, feeling that responsibility, you know, because I was a writer, because I can't, I can't get up and speak very articulate, in an articulate way, so I have to write. And um, so for the next few years, that's what I really wanted to do was work on that. And I wrote a book that came out of that called Something's Rising. And then I wrote a book for young readers uh, called Same Son Here. Um, and not to get too political, but I mostly wrote that book with Neela Vaswani, mainly because the coal industry was very entrenched in the school systems in eastern Kentucky. Um, and so I wanted to find a way to sneak in the environmental. <laughs> and, so, and so now elementary schools in Eastern Kentucky have that book, too. That was just my way of, that's the only way I know how to fight back, is to write. And I mean, I feel like, you know, creating a word like Afrolatcha, is, that's a political act, wouldn't you think? I mean. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we think of, of using that word as as also being revolutionary. Although, when we first started using it, uh, Crystal would tell you we got a fair amount of pushback. I mean, people would tell us we didn't have the right to do that. Uh, you know, so we, uh, my favorite story has been at the Kentucky Book Fair, uh, and this gruff looking gentleman walked up and stood in line. I could tell he was not in a good mood, and he got to the front of the line. He said, I've been looking at my map, and ain't no Afrolatcha on there nowhere. Yeah. And then he leaned back for a response, and I said, you know, is that a, is that a black and white map you're looking at? <laughs> and he said, he said, yes, of course it is. I said, well, that's the problem. <laughs> you got to get one of those new color ones. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, he wasn't sure if that was the real answer or not. He just walked away and stood there for a second. Oh, that's it, next, you know. <laughs> But absolutely, I think that, you know, defining yourself, claiming the space is an is a activist, you know, uh, position. Uh, being defined by other people is, is too passive for me. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the things I love about, you know, living in this region, I've, I've tried to move away from here at least five times, and there's a boomerang in my luggage, apparently. Mm -hmm. Just keep coming back. Uh, and it's... It's not just the land, and it's not just the people. There, there's something special about the relationship between the land and the people that makes this a special place, I think. Um, the, the value system, in spite of the, the negative stereotypes and characters about this region, you know, if you sit on the porch with, we all know some good people, uh, and, they're not, and they're in every generation, you know, pure heart, you know, loving, kind, generous. Uh, if you sit with them, uh, I miss the closest to heaven you can get. I mean, you learn so much, and you, you feel you come away from that space cleansed. Uh, go to a New York City, and you get the exact opposite of that. You know, people are so cutthroat and moving at such a pace that it's, I don't think I can survive in one of those other kinds of spaces that uh, don't allow for this speed of, of existing and, and living. Um, you know, this, I've tried it, and it just doesn't work for me, at least for me. Uh, and, have any of you tried to move away and, and be drawn back for a specific reason? <laughs> yeah, I lived in D.C. for five years, and I lived in Durham, North Carolina for three, and I came back each time. You, you can't quite stay away for the same reasons you're saying. You know, I was born uh, just up the river, so uh, I, I haven't moved that far away, but Cincinnati culture is not the same as my hometown of Steubenville. And uh, Steubenville is, is still, but, but when I, especially when I was coming up, so incredibly complicated and so incredibly complex that I, I was blind to it as I lived there. I think all of us may be blind to our local culture until something uh, gets, gets some distance for us. And for me, it was just moving you know, down the river to a bigger city. Uh, but. Uh, you know, my relationship talk about love-hate. You know, for a long time, uh, I, I was not very proud to be from Steubenville, Ohio, uh, because I didn't know what Ann spoke of in the last panel, the cause. You know, Eric mentioned it too. Here are the symptoms on one hand, and those the symptoms were what I was not proud of. 
But the cause was something that was invisible to me until I became a little bit more politically aware and began to understand how things worked. Because it was a completely capitalist extractive industry economy there. Every, even every subsidiary industry had something to do with the mill. So uh, it took me a long time and some distance, a little bit of sort of exile, al although you know, it's still a higher river culture, to, to kind of begin to see it. You said something at the beginning that I thought was interesting also. Uh, you said, how, you know, how do you keep something from being a polemic? And I think that is the key question for any mm -hmm. of us who write about politics. Um, and uh, you know, when I was first starting out, I, I'm like, I want to save the world. You know, I want to write a novel that's going to upend the coal industry. You know, I want to totally transform Appalachia. You know, <laughs> and, and then I'm, I'm, and I'm about that time I was reading about uh, Abraham Lincoln's favorite, uh, famous quote to uh, comment to Harriet Beecher Stowe, saying, "This is the little lady who started the war." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "What? <laughs> you know, is that what I want? Or do I do I want to start a war? Or do I want to kill millions of people? I mean, no." Uh, and that really caught me up short and made me realize. Um, that I needed to examine that question of polemics and really what was I doing and what kind of novel did I want to write. And um, uh, so I was very aware that not only was I, I was creating people with different political points of view and I, I started seeing them as banging up against each other. You got a couple of socialists, you got a, got a guy who's running a whorehouse, you know, you've got a coal miner who's not political and then he is, you got a guy who just goes to the World War I and comes back shooting people. Yeah, yeah, and then you've got a, a, a young man who grows up on a farm in eastern Kentucky who really stands for me. Uh, grows up on a farm in eastern Kentucky and has the chance to come to Berea and make something of himself. And then after he does that, he's hired by a coal company up in Boston to be the face of the coal company back here in West, in West Virginia, Kentucky. And that character's name was Miles. And, and I hated what Miles became, but I understood exactly. He didn't want to push a plow on a, on a dirt farm in, in Pike County, Kentucky, although I call it, changed the name of it. But, um, and that helped me to see into the coal company side of things. Uh, and, um, and so I wrote the book, and um, when I was doing my reading tour, I, I was invited to Emory and Henry College uh, uh, most of you probably know where some of you know where that is, and, and near Abingdon, Virginia, which is the headquarters of, of then the Pittston Coal Company, which um, back then was infamous for the, the Buffalo Creek flood, which was one of the defining moments of my life in terms of radicalizing me politically. And um, I was told before the reading, somebody came up to me about 10 minutes before and said, by the way, uh, you should know Mr. Comicia is here tonight. Well, Mr. Comicia and his brother were two Italian Sicilian coal miners who came to this country, worked in the mines, worked their ways up to be the president and vice president of the Piston Company. And of course, being, having a, a Sicilian father and a Sicilian grandfather who was a coal miner, I was like, uh, you know, this is like, I don't, I'm not going to go out on this stage tonight, you know, because uh, I'm like, this guy is going to nail me. And, uh, and I didn't, and I'm like, you know, I hated Pittston uh, for what they had done at Buffalo Creek. And um, so I did the reading, and they told me he's on the front row. And, um, he came up to me after the reading and said, you nailed it. You, know, you got it right. And, I, and it just blew me away. And uh, I felt then... Uh, that that's part of the key to not being polemical, is to try to see the humanity in uh, everybody. I, there was one character in Storming Heaven who I did not do that with, I think is my only failure as a character, and, it, and maybe it's because he's a minor character, and Ian Forster said, you don't have to worry about the minor characters, so I try not to worry about him. <laughs> but he's the guy who, named Denby who throws an African-American minor in the furnace, uh, and later on threatens Rondahl, the main character. And he's just, he's a one-dimensional character, I think, um, uh, but I, overall, I've tried uh, have a character in on Quiet Earth, Arthur Lee Sizemore, who's the local superintendent. He's also the local crooked politician, uh, and he's a jerk in a lot of ways, and, um, but he loves his community, and he's one of the people who dies trying to warn people to get out when the dam breaks. And um, so I try to always keep those characters in mind and keep them in the community of the novel. I think I do that better in my novels than I do in real life. 
You know, I can't stand Don Blankenship. <laughs> Uh, I almost cussed there, but I, I stopped myself. Um, but I like my characters better. I think I like all my characters, uh, with that one exception. So I think that's part of the key to the polemical part. I don't know what you guys think. Well, I, I want to acknowledge how how many of us you have inspired to fight back, Denise. You really did. <laughs> I've, I've told Denise this before, I think, but w w when I was uh, in high school, we used to go over to Whitesburg, a, a carload of us go to Whitesburg and try to catch a glimpse of Denise Jardina because we knew she was living there because she yeah, was a hero a to us. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, Dick, I was wondering if, I, I hope you won't mind me bringing this up, but um, you really put yourself on the line as in a really, uh, in a political act of, Standing up for justice. I admire you so much for that. You refused to sign an agreement between you and your school. Well, it was, it was the archdiocese. Right. That was discriminatory, you felt, and so you wouldn't sign it. And Absolutely it became pu very public. It yeah. got in the press. Yeah. Do you think that, can you talk about how being an artist informed that decision? Um, yes, it was all about imagery. Uh, as soon as I read that contract that had about 10 clauses that you had to initial individually that you agreed with, and they were all um, matters of the groin, uh, and, and, and then there was also a, a labor relations element to it as well, um, the, the images that came to my mind were the faces of all the kids that I had known over the years who came out to me or were openly gay or lesbian, uh, my colleagues, many of whom had been gay, my professors in college. That's what came first to me, was this, was this gallery of faces. And I said, this is, I, what, if I signed this, what would those faces look like? How would I feel? And it would have been you know, an intense betrayal. So the first time I read it, I knew it was, it was a no-brainer, really. I didn't agonize over it. I said, there's no way I can sign this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm very grateful for how it worked out, really. Uh, that was in May, and at the end of the school year, uh, the kids, so I wrote a big letter to the archdiocese, to the, to the superintendent of schools, and that kind of went national a little bit. But the best thing was that the, the kids voted me teacher of the year at the end of the year, and so I was able to make a final farewell speech, you know, and to remind them that you know, we had studied letter from Birmingham jail every year I taught practically. And an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And it was just a, a great teaching moment at the end, really. Um, I still feel very bad for the younger faculty members and those who you know, weren't in any kind of personal position to refuse. And I, and I, I, I uh, I, I resent the archdiocese for having put them in that position. So many people were put in a position where they had to compromise their conscience. Um, but like I said, I, it was not any kind of deliberate heroic act on my part. It was a no-brainer. And it was because I saw the faces of everybody that I knew. Well, thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a political panel, so I will get political a little bit here and just say, why couldn't other people just resign and <laughs> somebody in the news right now could have resigned and saved us all a bunch of money and, you know, but anyway, <laughs> I'll hold off. Y'all know how I feel. <laughs> yeah. um, but, I mean, you have all done such important work. and. I wonder if you all think that the important work you've done and the admiration that so many of us, despite the admiration so many of us have for all three of you, do you think being political has in ways hurt your writing careers or hurt your writing or can you just talk about the, you know, the bad parts of that? I'll tell one story. I was at a, at the university, 
Uh, I won't say which one. Um, maybe I'll sneak it out in between. <laughs> but um, we had, maybe it was the fourth issue of Pluck. If you know Pluck, you can figure out which university it was. <laughs> and we published a, a long poem by Nikki Finney that was, that was very critical of George Bush. That particular school was, was courting some money because they wanted to build a new law school. And somehow those things became connected and I was called into the legal office and told that they just found a clause and discovered that it was illegal for the school to pay to publish Pluck anymore. Or, or any journal, uh, but they were gonna start with Pluck and investigate and so as of that moment, and we were a day from going to press for the next issue and they you know, had to scratch the entire, entire issue. Um, and then a month later, uh, I got a, a nice letter that said that my, um, my visiting artist position uh, would not be renewed. And they were telling me a year earlier than they needed, it was a three-year contract, but they were telling me two, <laughs> two years <laughs> out <laughs> that it would not be renewed and I should start looking for other opportunities. But um, lucky for me, it wasn't super depressing because I'd already been courting another university at the time and I was about to say I was gonna take that job a year later, but I took it earlier because they kind of forced me to do so. So I think there are consequences for being political, obviously, and they generally come down to things tied to, to money. Not a whole lot of people, but I think a, a community can be discolored because one person with power and money made a decision that seems to impact and and discolor the entire region mm -hmm. and, and community and school. Uh, and I know that it wasn't that school uh, that made that decision. It was the person who said, we need that money. And if that person has a problem with this individual, law school, journal, black teacher, it's a no brainer. Uh, and it came in writing. Uh, I'm still a little pissed about it, you know. Uh, <laughs> And one day I'll, I'll be comfortable just saying to school and giving everybody who's connected to it uh, a name out loud in public, but I think that would hurt other people you know, who work there. Um, but yes, I think there are consequences. Denise, I saw you nodding. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I, think, I think there's a fashion in American literature that I'm not with, <laughs> for example. I think part of it has to do, I was listening to the earlier panels, and part of it has to do from, with being from this region. Uh, uh, but also, I think part of it has to do with being political. There aren't many people in American writing today that are writing about political stuff in the way that I do, which I think if I had been born earlier and had been writing in the 1930s, I think probably I would be more in tune with the way things were. You know, like, you know, I'm being like, uh, you know, I mean, John Steinbeck did that. Um, but, um, I, yeah, and maybe, I, you know, I don't want to sound self-pitying, <laughs> so old self-pitying writer, but I do think that there is, uh, it's an uphill battle to write about the Appalachian and the political and the working class. How many novels are there about the working class? Mm -hmm. um, there are exceptions. Uh, you know, E.L. Doctorow, I think, was an exception, uh, and, uh, um, um, there have been a few others, but not many. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, Lee Smith says that, <clears throat> she said one time, um, I speak like this uh, because it's a political decision. It's a political decision for me to keep my dialect, to keep my accent. And I think what she meant by that was she knew it would have consequences, but it was a way of fighting back to, to talk the way that she grew up talking. I think a dialect about that, about dialect that way a whole lot. I always speak grammatically correct, but people who meet me for the first time would swear up and down that I didn't because of my accent. Mm -hmm. I've had people correct my grammar when I wasn't speaking grammatically incorrect because of my accent, you know. This is piggybacking onto the earlier panel right, about right. dialect, but I've had the same experience. I did an analysis, I had a, a reading, um, out of state uh, when I wrote a novel called Saints and Villains about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German minister in World War II, and uh, 
Uh, and I was just in the early stages of it. It's stupid to read something when you're in the early stages, but that's what I did because that's what I was interested in at the time. So I read this, and the, and the, the professor who had set this up came up to me afterwards, and there were people standing around. He said, you know, you really shouldn't be writing that. He said, your accent's not right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Vice, you think I can't write about the chairman people? <laughs> yeah. I, c I couldn't resist that. <laughs> <laughs> the woman who wrote The Hunger Games used to do her readings in an Appalachian accent until somebody told her not to, you know, because The Hunger Games are set in Appalachia, and she's right. not from there. But so, um, Silas, I was going to say that I think there's a positive side to, to um, for example, a press like Bottom Dog Press, which has both an Appalachian writer's series and a working class series. Um, if you find the right people, then you're not, it's not a debit whatsoever, it's, it's a plus. So uh, there's room for all sorts of things, but uh, there are presses that uh, do want political writing, and they, they do want writing that kind of address explicitly, maybe in non-fictional ways, as well as fictional right. ways or poetic ways, yeah, what's I'm happening. Right, I agree. Yeah. Um, I bring up dialect in particular as political, simply because I think that people feel so free to pick on accents and dialect because it's, they consider this accent and this dialect to be the accent and dialect of poverty. And so they feel like it's okay to pick on people who are associated with poverty, you know? Even if they don't know anything about your personal socioeconomic background, they hear that particular accent, they associate with poverty, so it's okay, it's okay to pick on it, right? Um, well, do you all have any uh, last thing you'd like to say before we close up and get to the book signing? Have we covered it all? We covered every bit of it. I think I'm we? done. <laughs> Denise? I don't, if you have one minute, I have a passage from our sister, Ann Pancake. That'd be great. Yeah, and she writes, uh, I gotta find this and get it up close here. It, I, I think it's really apropos of what we're doing here. Well, he's finding that, I'll tell you, we'll close with this reading from Ann Pancake. The book signing will be right over here. Um, and then right at 320, Caroline Herring will be on this stage. You don't want to miss it. She's one of the best singer-songwriters that there is out there. And she writes so beautifully about working class issues, about uh, race and uh, gender and, and all the things that are really important to our mission here at Berea College in particular. So, Dick, if you'll close us out. Well, Ann will. Um, this is how she ends an essay that uh, she published in Georgia Review. I believe literature's most pressing political task of all in these times is envisioning alternative future realities. My biggest disappointment with my own political novel is not the missteps where I strayed into polemic or awkwardly integrated information. My biggest disappointment that my no is that my novel does not provide vision beyond the contemporary situation in central Appalachia. I have learned that it's much easier to represent a political situation in literature than it is to propose alternatives, to dream forward without lapsing into Pollyannaism or cynicism. But I've come to believe that the greatest challenge for many 21st century artists is to create literature that imagines a way forward which is not based in idealism or fantasy, which does not offer dystopia or utopia, but still turns current paradigms on their heads. I now feel charged to make stories that invent more than represent, that dream more than reflect. This is not to say I have more than glimmers of what such fiction will be, but I carry a burning urgency that it must be done. Boy, that's, that's a challenge, is it not? <laughs> Thank you all so much. Frank, Dick, Denise, thank you all very much for being here. We'll see you back at 320. Please come back.